Hello everyone, welcome to session two of LTech 623 Digital Video Design. I want to begin by complimenting you on your Critical Reflection 1 Flipgrid postings. I really enjoyed hearing all of the different ways video has played a role in your educational journeys. Thanks for having fun with this assignment and helping us to get to know one another a little bit. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes just sharing with you the results from the equipment and prior knowledge inventory. And as you can see here, everyone in the class has access to a video recording device. That's great. 72% or 13 of the 18 of you that responded said that your main recording device is going to be your smartphone, which means another five of you have some sort of other device. Uh, that's great. For this question, I am comfortable transferring video files from a video recording device to my computer. 16 of you agreed or strongly agreed, and then two of you disagreed or strongly disagreed. So if you are one of those two folks, don't worry, I'll be working with you to help you move those files from device to device as needed. The next question asked what operating system you use. 12 of you or about two thirds of the class said Mac OS and another 6 or 33% said Windows. Another item stated, I've been involved with video production in the past. About half the class said yes, a little over half actually, and seven of you said no. When it comes to uploading videos to a video sharing site, the vast majority of you said that you have done that before, and three of you said you haven't. Uh, don't worry again, folks, that's something we'll cover in this class. Here we get into editing video, and this question asked, I have experience editing video files with a consumer software package, such as iMovie or Camtasia. Quite a few of you, actually 12 of you, agreed or strongly agreed. One person wasn't quite sure and answered in the middle, and then we have another five folks who either disagreed or strongly disagreed. We see a similar spread when it comes to editing video files with a professional software package. Here we have six who agreed, two who were neutral, and then 10 who said they disagree or strongly disagree. So that's just a little bit of background. Hopefully you'll realize that there's somebody in the class that is similar to you. And having access to this information is helpful for me in thinking about how quickly we can cover various topics. So thanks for filling out that quick inventory. Now what I want to do is talk a little bit about putting video in context. Now, we'll be spending a lot of time this semester really studying the design of video, but it's important to recognize that video is never consumed in a vacuum. In other words, there's always a context surrounding the use of video in education. And I want to talk about some of the different aspects that we need to keep in mind when thinking about learning with video. And so one of those aspects is technological infrastructure. In other words, what's possible technically with digital video? And this has to do with controlling the pace of the video, editing the video, bookmarking it, segmenting it, sharing it, so on and so forth. The technological infrastructure that supports video is very important when thinking about learning with video. Now, another important aspect, of course, is the video content itself. What's the video about? How was it shot? How was it produced? And we'll really be focusing on that this semester in 623. Another important aspect is the task structure. In other words, what are we asking learners to do with the video? What is the task? So are we asking them to follow a prescriptive set of activities? Or are we asking them to select a clip from a library of clips? Are we asking them to watch a whole bunch of videos and choose their favorite? All of those are examples of tasks. And of course, the task involving video is going to influence how people learn with video. And then importantly, there's also the aspect of social structure. In other words, what's the social context in which video is being used? Is it being used as part of a class, students in a group? Is it an in-service teacher working individually? Or is video being used with a group of people? Is it being facilitated? So all of these different aspects are important. Now, we're not going to focus on most of these. We're just going to be focusing on number two, which is really about the design of the video, its content, and its production value, and its aesthetic properties. 
But I want you to be aware that all of these other aspects influence learning with video. And of course, we could apply all of this that we just talked about to the Flipgrid assignment. So we could think about, well, what is the infrastructure that Flipgrid provides? What was the content of the videos you created? What was the task that I, as the instructor, assigned to you? And then how does the fact that we're doing this as part of a group within a department, within a class, how does that social structure influence the learning that occurred as a result of these videos? So interesting things to think about. Moving on, I want to acknowledge that there are important advantages of using video over other media. So let's talk a little bit about some of those known advantages. Well, one of those advantages is that video saves time. Although upfront costs are high, video ultimately saves time at the point of delivery and when material must be repeated. In other words, if you want to give multiple groups of people the same information over and over again, creating that video, the cost might be high up front, but ultimately you could save money in the long term by reusing that information. Another advantage is that video can deliver more information in less time. We can cut out a lot of the unnecessary information so that a video can be jam-packed with pertinent knowledge and information. Another advantage is that video saves money by reducing the costs of training and communication. Also, video increases efficiency because learners can control the scheduling of viewing. In other words, video enables just-in-time learning. Oh, I don't know how to unclog my sink? Well, I can just load up a video and watch how to do that when I need it in the time that it is most relevant to me. And of course, that's very powerful. Another advantage is that video reduces travel time and costs because instructors can travel less. Also, video extends the viewing audience and opens up communications both locally and globally. Another advantage is that video is consistent. All viewers receive the same information in the same style of delivery. It creates a reliable, constant delivery system. And in some cases, that is an advantage. And finally, video is inherently interesting. There's probably some room for debate here, but it's interesting because combining color, motion, sound, and visuals, it's all very interesting and can be quite engaging when done effectively and designed with intention. So those are some of the advantages of video that you probably know on some level, but may not have thought about specifically before. Now, let's counteract that with the idea that video and education is not a silver bullet. So let's talk about some of its known limitations. For example, viewers can only attend to a selection of what might be noticed in a video, and that selection may be biased in ways that may hinder learning. So as we all know, there can be a lot going on in a video. Learners have limited amounts of attention, and they must choose what they want to focus on, and they may not be able to absorb everything going on in the video. And relatedly, their biases will influence what they pay attention to. Another known limitation is that viewers may be distracted by seductive details or features of the video that cause cognitive overload. They don't necessarily contribute to learners' learning, but they look fancy and they're fun to look at, but they're not actually facilitating understanding. Another limitation is that viewers can form strong, lasting impressions based on very thin slices of video. And that can be kind of dangerous. It can give folks the impression that they understand something just because they simply remember it. But what they remember may not be representative of the actual concept or topic that they are trying to understand. Another limitation is that viewers may notice irrelevant personality characteristics and fail to notice important features such as decision making, content knowledge, and pedagogical content knowledge. In other words, viewers may pay attention to things they shouldn't be paying attention to. And this is particularly true when using video in education. Another limitation is that viewers may take an evaluative perspective that hinders their ability to consider why a video event plays out the way it does and what they might learn from it. In other words, viewers have to learn to kind of step back and imagine themselves 
in different roles rather than taking on a purely knee jerk or evaluative perspective. So learning to learn with video and from video is something that requires practice and training. With that, I want to transition now to talk about the Hanch article, Video and Online Learning, that we read in week one. Now, importantly, I want to distinguish the three independent dimensions of video that's talked about in Hanch's article. Of course, those three independent dimensions include production style, production value, and visual aesthetics. So let's define those. Production style, of course, refers to the method of visual organization that is employed to realize a video's goal. We'll take a look at examples of that in just a minute. The second dimension is production value, and this refers to the technical aspects of the program quality. In other words, how good is the visuals? How good is the cinematography? How good is the value? It's often a reflection of the amount of effort and money that went into the production of the video. And third, but certainly not least, is visual aesthetics. And that refers to the beauty or pleasing appearance of the video. And aspects include balance, color, proportion, and novelty. And it's important that when we're watching and creating videos this semester, that we consider all three of these independent dimensions of video, because they all interact and influence the viewing experience. Now, to close out, I want to focus in on the production style dimension. And specifically, I have organized the various types of videos that Hanch and colleagues identified in their article, and I have categorized them into three high-level categories of production style. The first production style I have categorized as chalk and talk videos. And these videos you're all familiar with. In fact, this video is an example of a chalk and talk video. It can include include animations, presentation slides, tablet captures, or screencasts. These videos have no people in them, and they're useful for visualizing abstract concepts and relations. They can allow for step-by-step -step walkthroughs. The slides can be in any format with a voiceover, and annotations can be used to highlight information or draw viewer attention to particular areas or concepts. So category one of production style is the chalk and talk video. Category number two is the talking head video. And you could see some variations of this, but this is the common style involving one person. It may be scripted or unscripted, sometimes involves a demonstration of a skill. It can be used to build a connection between the person on camera and the viewer. More sophisticated talking head videos will involve multiple camera angles, and they may be used for easier editing and to break up monotony. Oftentimes, text or graphics will be overlaid onto a video to summarize main points, highlight keywords and phrases, or visualize what is being discussed. So that's our second example of production style. And our third category are conversation style videos. And these involve interviews, conversations, seminars, office hours. And these involve two or more people interacting. And they can give viewers the feeling that they are in the room with the speakers. This is a good way to involve outside experts from a particular field. And videos in this category can involve formal interviews, or they could be more conversational in nature about a particular topic. And the aim of these types of video is to capture authentic conversations, and they may help build a connection between presenters and viewers. And so there you have it, folks, three categories of production style. And in this course, we will be studying in detail how to create educational videos in each of these production styles. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.